Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fuck's Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and my co-host with some new holes in her head is Katie. Everybody needs some new holes in their head. They're very cute piercings, too. Thank you. I like them. But for now, let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 29, Career Advice, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. That's it. That's the flashback. I mean, you're not wrong, but there was more to it than that. All right. Okay, fine. All right. We'll see. Hermione is skeptical about the end to Harry's occlumency lessons. McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. It is unsure as to whether Ron is more critical of the Gryffindor Quidditch team or his own father. McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. The combination of Ginny and the twins creates an unholy trinity of trouble. McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. Snape is a passive-aggressive petty-ass bitch, but what else is new? McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. Umbridge tries to be a career cockblock for Harry. And did I mention that McGonagall is a badass motherfucker? McGonagall is a badass motherfucker. She is. Muffucker. Muffucker. <laughs> Bitch is a witch. During episode 170, a lot to be upset about. Our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on this career advice with McGonagall being left out? And we want to know what career you would want to hold in the wizarding world. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter pondering. How do I feel about the movie not including this scene? And what will my profession be in the wizarding world? Well, I am extremely disappointed and per usual pissed off because why did we not get to see this epic, petty McGonagall? McGonagall? McGonagall in. Okay? Why? They wanted to make up a whole altercation between the two instead of using the content that y'all already have in a damn book. Make it make sense, because it don't. And this was so, so nice to read. Just literally set her ass down. Petty Supreme McGonagall put um bitch in her place. Yeah, I said it. Bruh, that would have been real nice to see. My profession, obviously, a lot of y'all already know that I'm a nurse. So, of course, I'll be working at St. Mungo's. What you mean? Okay, I'll be in there Whipping up wine and the Milettis, fixing everybody up, sending them home with a smile on their face. That would be nice. Perfect transition. I would like to know what are the requirements for that. We got to find out what Harry needed to do to become an Aura. Let me see the nursing curriculum. That would have been cool. Hey guys, it's Jackson here with my Potter Pondering for this week. For the first part, how do I feel about this whole sequence of Harry talking to Sirius being left out? Well, it's pretty clear my feelings on things being left out in the movies by this point. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it! <laughs> now, as for my Wizarding World career, I've actually thought of a couple of things I'd do. One, I'd do something with Quidditch, either playing it or possibly a commentator. The other careers I've thought about are working with muggles, like in the muggle liaison office. Although remember, if you're going to liaise with Vernon Dursley, you don't need a good sense of fun. You need a good sense of when to duck. <laughs> and the other career I thought about would be in magical law enforcement. Not an aura, maybe just a regular wizard cop, like someone from the magical law enforcement squad. Hey, this is Jessica calling in my Potter Pondering this week. First of all, how I feel about Harry's career advice meeting with McGonagall being cut. And I can 
pretty much assume that we all agree that that's freaking ridiculous. First of all, uh, what the actual dragon dung was going on during the writing of this movie? How could anyone ever think this scene was something they didn't need? Ew, David. Yeet. I just don't even want to. I'm so mad about this. It could have been so great seeing McGonagall call Umbridge an incompetent teacher. Oh, man. Oh, I just love it. It's so satisfying. Yeah. So that sucks. Anyway, what job would I want in the magical world? I probably want to do something along the lines of magical creature, something or another, maybe join the ministry and work to give magical creatures more rights, possibly change the department name from the regulation and control to regulation and rights of magical creatures. And maybe even, like, eventually give the more sentient beings, I guess, like centaurs, house elves, and werewolves, their own branch separate from the control of magical creatures, like dragons and thestrals and trolls and shit, because they're not really on the same level at all and shouldn't be lumped together. And if we go by certain law that I usually ignore, Hermione, like, ends up being the Minister of Magic. So I think she would help in making those changes. But yeah, probably, I mean, if I'm not teaching at Hogwarts, I'd probably do that. But I mean, it would be really cool to be one of the, you know, professors, maybe magical creatures professor. I don't know. Typical question. I'm I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say. So, hi. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was... Who is in the kitchen when Harry's head appears in the fire to talk to Sirius? It's Lupin sitting at the kitchen table, not Sirius. But he does go to get him so Harry can talk to him. Congratulations goes to Megan Slater. Woohoo! She is up to three weeks in a row. I think she can keep this going. Do you think she can keep this going? We shall see. For now, let's dive into the second half of chapter 29 career advice, and the corresponding film scenes that don't really correspond or really fit anywhere else. Chapter 29, Career Advice, Part 2. As Harry hurries down the corridor, he can hear Umbridge and McGonagall shouting at one another, and the former is still breathing like she ran a race when she arrives in defense against the dark arts that afternoon. As they are all getting their books open, Hermione again tells Harry that she hopes he has thought better of his plans, since Umbridge already looks like she's in a bad mood. She does occasionally glower at Harry, who just keeps his head down, as he imagines how McGonagall would react if he gets caught trespassing in Umbridge's office just hours after she vouched for him. He considers returning to Gryffindor Tower and just hoping for a time during the summer holiday to talk to Sirius, but the very idea feels like a lead weight in his stomach. Plus, Fred and George already have the diversion planned, and he's set with the knife from Sirius and his invisibility cloak. He is still concerned about being caught, and Hermione keeps reminding him about Dumbledore sacrificing himself so Harry could stay at school, begging him not to do it. He isn't sure what to do, and Ron isn't really willing to give his opinion one way or the other, though he does tell Hermione to give it a rest since Harry can make up his own mind. His heart starts racing as they leave the classroom, and partway down the corridor they can hear the unmistakable signs of the diversion. When Umbridge hurries out of her classroom and heads the opposite direction with her wand out, Harry knows that it's now or never. Hermione gives a final plea, but Harry is decided, and runs off to Umbridge's office. He hides behind a suit of armor and pulls his cloak and the knife out of his bag. Once invisible, he creeps back to her office door and slides the blade of the knife into the crack of the door. With a tiny click, the door swings open and Harry ducks in, closing it behind him. He moves to the fireplace and finds a small box containing flu powder. Crouching down in front of the fire, he sticks his head in and drops a pinch of the powder onto the logs. 
They burst into emerald green flames, and he clearly says number 12 Grimmauld Place. Though he has traveled by flu powder before, that was his whole body, and it is an extremely weird feeling for only his head to spin through the flames. When the spinning stops, he opens his eyes to see that he's looking out of the kitchen fireplace at the long wooden table, where a man is looking at a piece of parchment. Harry calls out Sirius's name, but it is Lupin at the table. He looks shocked to see Harry's head in the fire and asks if everything is all right. Harry says it is, but he fancied a chat with Sirius. Lupin is confused, but gets to his feet to fetch Sirius, who is currently looking for Creature. Harry waits as he hurries out of the kitchen, wondering why Sirius never mentioned how uncomfortable it is to speak from the fire. A few moments later, Lupin returns with Sirius and they both kneel down by the fire and look at Harry with concern. Harry explains why he's there and what he saw in the pensive. Neither man speaks for a moment, then Lupin quietly speaks up to tell Harry not to judge his father by what he saw there, especially since he was only 15. Harry points out that he is 15, and Sirius speaks up too to explain that James and Snape hated each other instantly, that there was a lot of jealousy and Snape was really into the dark arts, which James always hated. Harry points out that he attacked Snape for no reason, just because they were bored. Sirius responds that he's not proud of it, and Lupin explains that James and Sirius were both very popular and could sometimes get carried away. Sirius cuts him off to say that they could actually be arrogant little Burks, and Lupin smiles. Harry mentions how James kept messing up his hair, and the two men laugh, remembering their friend. Lupin asks if he was playing with the snitch, and Harry confirms this, also calling him a bit of an idiot. Sirius agrees, saying they were all idiots, though less so for Mooney. Lupin points out that he never tried to stop them from messing with Snape, and Sirius tells him that he did make them feel ashamed about it sometimes. Harry then brings up how his father kept looking at the girls by the lake, and Sirius shrugs, commenting on how James couldn't resist showing off when Lily was around. Harry then asks why she married him since she hated him, but Lupin and Sirius both explain that she didn't and started going out with him in their seventh year when his head deflated a little and he stopped hexing people for fun. Harry asks if that included Snape, and Lupin admits that Snape was a special case, since he never missed an opportunity to curse James either. When Harry still looks concerned, Sirius tells Harry that James was the best friend he ever had and a good person who grew out of being an idiot. Harry heavily agrees, adding on that he just never thought he'd feel bad for Snape. This makes Lupin ask how Snape reacted, and when Harry tells them that he ended occlumency lessons, both men are outraged and insist that Harry needs to go back to him and insist he start the lessons back up. Harry says he can't do that, Snape will kill him, but Lupin just sternly reminds him that nothing is more important than him learning occlumency. Harry is annoyed but agrees that he will try. They are cut off when he hears some distant footsteps and asks if Creature is coming down the stairs. Sirius says he isn't, that it must be someone on Harry's end, so Harry declares that he better go and pulls his head out of the fire. He feels the weird spinning feeling and then finds himself in Umbridge's office with just enough time to pull his invisibility cloak over himself as Filch opens the door, thrilled that he has approval for whipping. He finds a piece of parchment in a desk drawer, kisses it, then hurries back out, clutching it to his chest. Harry jumps to his feet and hurries after him, after making sure he's completely covered by his invisibility cloak. Once a landing down, Harry pulls off the cloak and shoves it back in his bag. He joins up with what seems to be the rest of the school, including teachers and ghosts, standing around the walls in a ring which is covered in something that looks like stink sap. They're watching Fred and George, who are cornered by the Inquisitorial Squad. Umbridge, who is only a few stairs in front of Harry, addresses the twins, wondering if they think it is amusing to turn the corridor into a swamp. Without an ounce of fear, Fred tells her that it is pretty amusing. Phil shows up with the form and begs her to let him whip them now. She agrees and tells Fred and George that they're about to learn what happens to wrongdoers in her school. Fred insists that he doesn't think they are and turns to George, saying he thinks they've outgrown their full-time education. 
George agrees, and they decide that it's time to test their talents in the real world. Before Umbridge can say anything else, they raise their wands and say, Akio brooms. After hearing a crash in the distance, Harry ducks just in time to avoid Fred and George's broomsticks flying down the corridor to the twins. When they stop in front of them, they both mount their broom and tell Umbridge that they won't be seeing her and to not bother keeping in touch. Fred then looks around at all of the students and announces that they can get their own portable swamp from their new premises for Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes, number 93 Diagon Alley. George adds on that they will give special discounts to Hogwarts students who swear they will use the product to get rid of Umbridge, who he calls an old bat. Umbridge shrieks for someone to stop them, but it's too late as Fred and George kick off the floor and hover 15 feet in the air. Fred looks across the hall at Peeves and instructs him to give her hell from them. Peeves, whom Harry has never seen take an order from any student, sweeps his hat off in salute as Fred and George fly out the open front doors to tumultuous applause. The movie section picks up right after Harry is told to leave Snape's office after their disastrous occlumency lesson. He hesitates in the corridor, recovering from the ordeal a bit, but is distracted when he hears a voice ask someone what their name is. As another voice responds, Michael, Harry looks behind him and sees Fred and George comforting a crying kid on a bench in the corridor. They are showing the boy their own scarred hands, letting him know that it isn't as bad as it seems and is fading already. Harry begins to walk towards them, but before he can say anything, they are interrupted by a him him and all look to the end of the hall to see Umbridge standing in the doorway. Harry takes several steps towards her and Fred and George get up and stand behind him as Umbridge informs Potter that she's told him before that naughty children deserve to be punished. She gives a self-satisfied little smirk before slowly turning and walking away. Fred tells George that he's always felt their futures lie outside the world of academic achievement, and George responds that he's been thinking exactly the same thing. Yeah, so part of the reason why we pushed this movie section to this part was because it really didn't fit in with last week, and that one was getting kind of long anyway. That's what she said. <laughs> But this conversation, I'm just going to ignore that. This conversation is actually sort of reminiscent of this section. A little bit, yeah. In some of what that is said, like, in two sentences. And that is about it. So other than that, this whole movie section, I say whole movie section, like it was longer than 30 seconds. But it didn't happen in the book. It doesn't really fit in anywhere. Mm -hmm. But it kind of matches this towards the end so you'll see the ding adjacents when we get there yeah the book chapter picks up right as harry's rushing out of mcgonagall's office not wanting to make any kind of eye contact with pepto bitchmall in any way shape or form because fuck that noise i mean who would want to aside from filch but he's weird yeah and i just love the fact that the entire time he's running down the corridor he can hear them shouting at each other and i just I really just wish we could have seen this. Like, this could have been a five-second thing where you just hear a little bit of yelling as Harry runs away. Oh, I know, right? And now, I don't know exactly how much time goes between this meeting and their defense against the dark arts class, but unfortunately for Harry, he basically goes from this meeting to defense against the dark arts. So he gets a double whammy of Pepto Bitch Mall. Nobody wants that. And apparently, she shows up after them. Because I imagine she stays at McGonagall's office in a screaming match for a while and then has to rush to class herself. So by the time she gets there, she's breathing like she just ran a race. Sure. And I have a feeling that that is not a woman who exercises. She exercises the audacity. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Hermione, being Hermione, has to say something right off the bat to Harry. Sure. She's been spending this whole day doing that anyway. Mm -hmm. They're all getting their books open to turn to the chapter they're supposed to read. And Hermione's just like, I really hope that you've thought better of this because she already looks pissed off. I mean, she always does, though. But more so. Yeah, true. And Harry doesn't say anything. He just kind of focuses on his book, keeps his head down. I don't know if he notices. I mean, he's the one that 
is narrating essentially. Mm-hmm. So he must notice if it's being mentioned. Yeah. But she does glower at him occasionally. Pepto bitch mall, that is. Probably Hermione too, but you know. Probably normal for both of them to do that, really. Yeah, especially considering what he's planning and what he just came from. Mm-hmm. But he just sort of pretends he's reading his work. He's probably actually trying to read that chapter, but all he can do is think about what McGonagall would do if she finds out he gets caught trespassing in Pepto Bitch Mall's office right after she vouches for him. Yeah, it's not going to be a good look for him. That's for sure. This is not one of his smartest ideas eh. for many levels. <laughs> yeah. I think that's an understatement. But he does consider just going back to Gryffindor Tower, hanging out in the common room, calling it a day, and hoping that he gets a chance to talk to his dog father sometime in the summer about what he saw. But even just thinking that causes him to feel like there's a lead weight in his stomach. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's definitely steering him towards do the thing, Harry, do the thing. (laughs) Harry, yes. Yes, exactly. Especially since Fred and George already have this whole diversion planned and he's got Sirius's pocket knife and his invisibility cloak with him. I mean, he's practically done it at this point. So why not actually do it? Everything seems to be coming up Millhouse for him. I gotta say. Right? That's... <laughs> he is obviously still concerned about getting caught. And then Hermione has to keep reminding him about how stupid it is. The big thing she's saying now is Dumbledore literally sacrificed himself so you could stay here at the school. And this is a really poor way to repay him. Like, don't do this. This is really dumb, Harry. Harry, no. But Harry, yes, though. Yeah. To be fair, he isn't 100% admitting that he's already decided. Boy has already decided. Mm -hmm. But in his head, he thinks he hasn't. Yeah. And it's not helping that Ron won't really give his opinion one way or the other. The closest he comes to taking sides is just telling Hermione to give it a rest and saying that Harry can make up his own mind. Yeah. Which is basically Ron saying, go ahead and do it, Harry. Let's be honest. I mean, was Ron really going to tell him not to, though? No. But the bell rings. And Harry's heart starts pounding as they're walking out of the classroom because we are hitting the do or die now or never moment. Mm -hmm. Especially when they get partway down the corridor and they can hear the sounds of unmistakable diversion. They still don't know what the diversion is at this point. But they know it when they hear it. it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Hermione gives one final plea. Don't do it, Harry. Harry, no. Harry, no. Harry, yes. Harry, yes. He's decided. He just turns the opposite direction and runs off to Pepto Bitch Mall's office, hides behind a suit of armor when he gets closer so that he can get his cloak and the knife out of his bag. Mm -hmm. As you do. Hides himself under the cloak, makes his way up to her office door, and the knife just works by opening it and inserting it into the crack of the door and just sort of like wiggling it downward over the lock. So it's like a credit card. And he hears a magical click. And the door swings open. Sure. So he goes in, shuts the door behind him, makes his way right over to the fireplace, finds the box that has the flu powder in it, kneels down and sticks his head into the fireplace, which I assume is not lit at this point because that would be dumb. Harry's not the smartest, but I do think he's smart enough. He's not in Ravenclaw, no. To not be that (laughs) dumb. But he grabs that pinch of flu powder and throws it onto the logs, which then burst into the Mm -hmm. emerald green flames. And since his head is already in the fireplace, it just immediately starts doing that spinning thing the moment he says number 12 Grimmauld Place, which he does so very clearly and does not end up with his head floating in a nocturne alley fireplace. Always a good thing. Yes. So he has traveled by flu powder before and isn't completely unfamiliar with that spinning sensation that happens. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time that it was just his head. And apparently that's even weirder, which I would imagine would be the case. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I don't know that I could do that. Just knowing that like my body is unprotected behind me somewhere (laughs) would freak me out. Yeah, I wonder if it like actually detaches your head briefly or if there's like some weird magical connection. Like the whole thing is just very odd. Even if it doesn't actually detach your head, which I mean, that seems odd. But 
even if it doesn't, it's still like your head is still in this fireplace and you don't know what's going on behind you. And I don't like that. No, that makes me very nervous. No, and it's not like he relocked the door behind him or anything. Right. Of course not. Because why would he? That's just silly. But like he seems to have this habit of putting his head places and just leaving his body like completely unprotected. Like, he puts his head in the pensive, as Snape calls it, and the pensive. Yeah, but I think he's still like full body falls into it. I don't know if it's just his head hanging in the water. I always thought it was just his head hanging in the water. Because hmm. he feels the whole sensation of falling. Well, true. Whereas this time it's just his head spinning. Either way. It's still strange. And when the spinning stops, he opens up his eyes and he's looking into the kitchen of Grim Old Place mm -hmm. and sees a man sitting at the table. So he calls out Sirius's name, but it's actually Lupin at the table. Which was our trivia question. It sure was. He looks really shocked when he sees Harry's head just hanging out in the fireplace. And it, of course, wants to know if everything's all right. Like that is the first question you ask somebody who illegally uses flu powder sure to come talk to his dog father yeah why not right harry assures him that everything's fine he just fancied a chat with sirius because yeah. that's practical no big deal lupin is rightfully confused but is also smart and says he'll just go fetch him tells him that he's currently up in the attic looking for creature and harry just sort of waits as lupin hurries away and eventually comes back and in that time though he's just like kneeling on the floor of Umbridge's office with his head in the fire. And he's like, how come my dog father never mentioned how uncomfortable this is? I don't know. Maybe he just likes being on his knees. Maybe. So he didn't think it was that uncomfortable. Who knows? Just saying. We don't know what Sirius does. No judges. No way. But when Lupin comes back with Sirius, they both kneel down next to the fire to be closer to Harry and look at him with concern. Which is what you do in this situation. It's completely understandable. Definitely. And so Harry tells him, because he knows he has limited time and has already lost probably about five minutes of the 20 that Fred and George guaranteed him. Mm -hmm. So he explains just, hey, yeah, this happened. And I saw this in the pensive. And just, you know, regales them with the whole tale that I'm sure they remembered, but also probably didn't impact them the same way it impacted Snape. Like, this was just Tuesday to them? Yeah. They were just kind of like, meh, it was another day. Although Tom called in the pondering last week. Mm-hmm. And he made a really interesting point about how the reason this was Snape's worst memory wasn't because he was bullied. He said that he was pretty sure that they all did worse to Snape than that. Like, he brought up the fact that they sent him mm -hmm. down the Whomping Willow when Lupin was actually a werewolf. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And he thinks that this was Snape's worst memory because he called Lily a mudblood. You know, that's a really good point, actually. And it would make sense. Yeah. Considering all of the guilt that he feels yeah. for Lily. Yeah. I liked that. And the one downside about us inserting the ponderings right before the episode goes out is that we don't mm -hmm. always have a chance to respond to them. So I wanted to make sure to mention that because I thought that was a really neat point. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Headcanon accepted. Fuck yeah. Thanks for that one, Tom. Well done, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Yep. But anyway, Harry explains this whole story and neither Lupin or Sirius have anything to say at first. And then Lupin finally just says, I really hope that you don't judge your father by what you saw there. He was only 15. And Harry's just like, what the fuck? I'm 15. Yeah. It's a very boys will be boys. Which is a fair point. Like, oh, your dad, he was just such a pip. When it really, it's like, mm. Yeah. And to be fair, they both had very different upbringings. Yes. James's upbringing definitely came with some audacity. Yeah. <laughs> and Harry's didn't really. James Potter and the audacity of that motherfucker. Right? <laughs> but Sirius also speaks up to kind of explain that James and Snape hated each other instantly mm -hmm. because there was a lot of jealousy on Snape's part and Snape was so into the dark arts, which is something that no matter what else he did, James has always hated. So it was just like this instant clash. Which I get. 
but that doesn't make any of that okay. Oh, no, it didn't. And that's exactly what Harry pointed out because he just said, yeah, but he attacked Snape for no reason just because you said you were bored. Yeah. And Sirius says, well, I'm not proud of it. And then Lupin speaks up again to kind of explain that James and Sirius were both very popular and very good at pretty much everything, so they could sometimes get carried away. Sirius then corrects Lupin and says, you mean we could be arrogant little Burks? I mean, that's a nice way of putting it, sure. (laughs) Yes. And they clearly, despite knowing that they were little assholes have fond memories of this time because now both men are kind of smiling. Oh, yeah, they're all wistful. Especially when Harry mentions that James kept messing his hair up Mm -hmm. even more. And then they actually laugh about it. And Lupin was just like, oh, my gosh, was he playing with the snitch, too? And Harry was like, yeah, he sure was. I thought he was kind of an idiot. Yeah. And Sirius was just like, well, yeah, we were all idiots. Maybe not Mooney so much. But Lupin wasn't going to really accept that pass because he was just like, I never tried to make you stop messing with Snape. Mm -hmm. I could have stood up. I could have said something. I just sat there and let it happen. And Sirius tells him, well, you did make us feel ashamed sometimes. That was something. (laughs) It wasn't nothing. Which, I mean, it is. He's not wrong. It is something. It's not a big something. Yeah. But it's better than nothing at all, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. Not really having anything to say anymore about that, Harry decides to bring up the next thing that's concerning him, which is how his father kept looking at the girls by the lake, Mm -hmm. particularly Lily. Yep. And Sirius says that James couldn't really resist showing off whenever Lily was around, which makes Harry just flat out go, why did she marry him? She hated him. (laughs) And then both men are like, no, she didn't. They started dating in their seventh year when James's head deflated a little bit and he stopped hexing people just for funsies in the corridors. I mean, it's good that she has standards, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Sure. Harry wants to know if those standards included not hexing Snape anymore. And Lupin has to admit that whereas it's not like he was bringing Snape on dates with Lily and hexing him in front of her, he did not actually stop hexing Snape because Snape was never going to stop attacking James. It just wasn't as publicly done anymore. And this is kind of when you find out that it was like reciprocal, too. Yes. And to be fair, in that memory, Snape did cut James' face. Yeah, because Snape was attacked first, but yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, but, you know... Who started it in the very beginning? Who the fuck knows? But like, I don't know, drawing blood over some humiliation is a little extreme. I do agree. However, they've all got magic fucking wands and lots of hormones. True story. 15 is tough. (laughs) 15 is tough. 15 with magic? That shit's dangerous. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So far, none of what they're saying is really making Harry feel better. He still looks very concerned. Mm -hmm. So Sirius just says, look, James was the best friend that I have ever had. And he was a good person who had to grow out of being an idiot. Yeah. So by this point, Harry's just like, yeah, okay. I just never thought I'd feel bad for Snape. Yeah, that would almost piss me off more than anything. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's what was really messing with him more than anything at all. Yeah. Like, what is this feeling of pity for this man that I hate? I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) Like, wait a minute. He's a human too? Fuck that. And when Harry brings up having emotions for Snape, Lupin's like, now that you mention it, how did Snape react when he found out you meddled in his memories? Hmm, yeah, about that. (laughs) Yeah, so Harry admits that he ended Occlumency lessons, threw him out of the office, and before he can say anything else about that, really, he starts to say that, like, that's a big deal, I was terrible at him, but doesn't get that far into that sentence because both Lupin and Sirius are so pissed Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They were like, you need to go back to him right now and insist he start those lessons back up. You have to do this. Dumbledore's going to be pissed. And Harry was like, I can't do that. He'll kill me if I go back to him. <laughs> and they insist that he has to try because nothing is more important than learning occlumency. So Harry's just like, okay, what the fuck ever? I'll try. It's not going to work, but... Like, let's put it this way. Snape will kill you if you do that. We will fucking kill you if you don't. Sirius is ready to march up to the school and have words with him. And Lupin is just like, back up. If anybody's going to have words with him, it's going to be me. (laughs) But I think Harry needs to handle this first. Yeah. And then they also planned on reporting it to Dumbledore. Look out, Harry. You've upset your dog father and dog mother. Right. Don't piss them off. Now, before they get any further into this topic of discussion, they're interrupted when Harry hears some distant footsteps and wonders if that's creature coming down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Sirius says that it's not, so it must be someone on Harry's end, which makes him realize he is out of time. And he says he's got to go and just pulls his head right out of the fire. And he has like a little bit of that weird spinning feeling and finds himself in Pepto Bitchmo's office once again, kneeling on the floor, hearing Filch getting closer and closer to Umbridge's door and literally has just enough time to pull the cloak back over his head as he's opening the door, which he's like, oh, she left it unlocked. Also, definitely not in Ravenclaw, Filch. No, 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 no. Good Lord. On the plus side, even if he had been in Ravenclaw he was far too distracted in excitement because he has approval for whipping yeah and he's practically singing about it as he walks into the office just like approval for whipping (laughs) approval for whipping they're finally gonna get what they deserve that sounds so dirty approval for whipping (sighs) only to you I mean yeah (laughs) (laughs) But Filch goes right into Pepto Bitch Mall's desk, rifles through one of her drawers, pulls out a form, which must be the approval for whipping form. Yes. Just to make it a little dirtier for you, he kisses said form. Yeah, yeah, he does. And then clutches it to his chest as he basically skips back out of the room. Oh, he's going to do dirty things with that piece of paper, man. Mm hmm. And the whip that he uses. And the whip. Yep. <sighs> Filch should not be around children. No, he definitely (laughs) should not be around children. There's a few people in this building like that. There is. Especially this book. Yes, definitely. But needing to get out of this situation now and having got as much of the information that he possibly could, Harry hurries after him as well after he makes sure that he's still completely covered by the cloak Mm -hmm. and goes down the stairs towards the entrance hall which is where everybody is gathered Mm -hmm. and pulls his cloak off shoves it back in his bag so that he can just kind of blend in with the crowd and it's very similar to the day that Trelawney got sacked the way that everybody is just like in one big circle watching what's going on except this time that one big circle is around what they say looks like stink sap (laughs) yeah and it's Fred and George that are in the middle having been cornered by the Inquisitorial squad. And then Pepto Bitch Mall herself speaks up and Harry realizes that she's actually only a few stairs in front of him. Awkward. So he's basically got front row seats at this point. Yeah. Right time, right place. Right. But Pepto Bitch Mall wants to know if it's amusing to turn the corridor into a swamp. I mean, fucking yeah. <laughs> and I know that we get something kind of similar to this scene a little bit later in the movie and we'll come back and talk about that Mm -hmm. when we get to it in the movie because they placed it at a time that really didn't line up with this yeah as we've mentioned before so we'll talk about it a little bit more then too obviously but i have to say that it wasn't this still Mm -hmm. and that is so disappointing to me because i would have loved to see fred look right at Pepto Bitch Mall with zero fear in his face to just say, yeah, pretty amusing. (laughs) Now that you mention it, I'm quite tickled. (laughs) Yep. And then Filch shows up with the form and he's just like, let me do it now. Let me do it now. (laughs) This is just getting dirtier and dirtier. (laughs) 
Anyway, <laughs> Filch wants to whip them for their wrongdoing, and Pepto Bitch Mall says that they can, and she tells Fred and George that they're about to learn what happens to wrongdoers in her school. You gonna learn today. Because she's getting way too big for her blush britches. Ellen, stop. <laughs> I beg of you. About to learn what happens to wrongdoers in her school, <laughs> and Fred's just like, you know, I don't think we are. Y'all fucked around, now you gonna find out. Nope, I don't think we are. No. Just turns to George and says, I've been thinking that we've outgrown full-time education. And George just like, yep, you know what? I've been thinking the same thing. Let's test our talents in the real world. Which we do kind of hear that in the movie. Yeah, it a is a little bit, bit so. similar-ish. Yeah. We're getting there. Mm-hmm. You know that Pepto Bitch Mall really wants to say something else, but she doesn't get the opportunity to because the twins have this plan to a T. And in unison, in their twin tandem talk... They say Akio brooms and following the sound of a very loud crash in the distance, their broomsticks just come flying down the corridor, down the stairs. Harry has to duck to avoid getting hit by them. I really hope some people did get knocked out of the way by these brooms. Right. <laughs> and then they come screeching to a stop right in front of the twins who mm -hmm. mount them and proceed to tell Umbridge... That they won't be seeing her and not to bother keeping in touch. Fuck y'all and this popsicle stand. Yeah. That's basically what's going on. So long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> then what is quite possibly my favorite part of this section, just the way it ends. It's just such a great little mic drop moment for the twins and mm -hmm. Peeves. Because firstly, Fred announces to all of the students that... If any of them would like their own portable swamp, they can get it from their new premises of Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes at number 93 Diagon Alley. George tacks on that they will give special discounts to any Hogwarts students who swear they're going to use the products to get rid of this old bat. God damn it, they're awesome. Right in front of her. Right in fucking front of her. Which, of course, makes that old bat shriek for somebody to stop them, but... They've already kicked off the ground. They're hovering 15 feet up in the air because, you know, yeah. castle, nice tall ceilings, very lofty. There's no seizing the boys at this point. Let's just say no. That. And before they make their grand exit, Fred looks across the hall at Peeves, who's just hovering there watching the mayhem and tells Peeves, give her hell from us. Mm hmm. I love that line. And Peeves takes off his hat and holds it to his chest in a salute, in a promise that, oh, he will. And Harry's just shocked because he's never seen Peeves take an order from a student before. Right? That's some top tier fuckery right yeah. there. I love There's it. There's some kindred spirit happening here. Mm-hmm, for sure. And then... They fly right out the open doors of the castle, off into the sunset as everyone applauds. Again, we do get something kind of similar in the movie. It's just not the same, and we'll talk about it more then. Yeah. Boo hiss. But what we do have to talk about now is the movie section picking up right after the clusterfuck that was Harry's last occlumency lesson with Snape. After being told to get the fuck out, Harry does so and finds himself in the hallway when he hears someone get asked for their name. A small voice says Michael, and Harry turns to see the twins comforting a sobbing young boy. Side note. We should probably bring this up now. Yeah. I literally thought that he was saying Nigel. It does sound like Nigel. I will admit to you, it does. I turned on the caption specifically for this reason, because it's a different kid. It is a different kid. It's not the kid we thought was Nigel. No, but the captions do have him as Michael. So that's what I was going by. Yeah, well, Michael, Nigel, either way, neither one of them were in the books. So, meh. So fuck that kid. <laughs> that's not how it happened in the book. <laughs> yeah, well, tell this part to join the fucking club. <laughs> but anyway... The twins are trying to lighten this kid's spirits by showing off their own deformities and attempting to convince him that 
permanent scarification isn't really all that bad. Them chicks dig scars. Yeah, the pain goes away after a while. You're fine. Don't be a bitch. Come on. Harry starts in their direction, but is stopped by his balls retreating right back up into his body at the sound of Pepto Bitch Mall's passive aggressive expectoration. That's coughing, for anyone who's wondering. Him, him. Him, him. <laughs> this brings all of their attention to the doorway she's standing in, just looking like the biggest bitch to ever have bitched. So Harry starts in her direction, followed by the twins. When she tells him that, as previously mentioned, bitches get stitches and permanent disfiguration. And then, with the shittiest of shit-eating grins, turns on her heel and pieces out. Which is kind of similar to her saying that students who misbehave at her school are going to find out what happens to them. Fuck around and find out. Bitches get yeah. stitches. Not really, though, but kind of. <laughs> I mean, exactly. It is ding adjacent. Naughty children deserve to be punished. That's creepy. She's creepy. Yes, she really is. At this point, Fred and George decide that they've learned all they needed, and it might be time to just blow this popsicle stand. Again, that's kind of similar to them in the book saying they've outgrown their full-time education. It's just, in the book, they said it right before actually flying out the door and it was more of an epic mic drop yeah whereas in the movie it was more of a it was almost more of a code phrase it was more of a foreshadowing yeah it was telling us what was going to come as opposed to preemptively allowing them to just declare they're leaving as they leave yeah as opposed to being a badass sign off basically. yeah it was totally a badass sign off in the book and it was uh -huh. just like a oh yes we're plotting something in the movie yeah. And of course, we didn't have a peeves or anything, so it's not like they right. could say shit to him, but... So disappointing. I know. I'm still trying to figure out who the fuck peeves is, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all we really had in this section was Harry, the twins, and Michael Nigel. Like... <laughs> who really just cried and said his name in a un-understandable sort of way, so... <laughs> Yeah. Doesn't really give us any actors to talk about, which means we'll just move on to our Potter pondering, which is, what are your thoughts on the portable swap being left out of the movie? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts, or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Carrie Choquette. She writes, Hello, my name is Carrie Choquette. I am a Ravenclaw. I have a walnut wand that is 13.75 inches with a Snallygaster heartstring core. A Snallygaster is a bird lizard that has similar characteristics of a dragon. My wand is swishy. Walnut is known as stiff. The rare combination with the Snallygaster heartstring makes my wand knowledgeable and resourceful. My Patronus is an owl. My introduction to Harry Potter was started slightly when I was a nanny in 2000. One of the boys wanted me to read a chapter to them. It was a chapter toward the beginning of the Chamber of Secrets. I was a little resistant as a person in my late 20s, then not wanting to read a children's book. I thought it was somewhat interesting, but once I put it down, I didn't think about it again. About a year later, my mom handed me the book of the Sorcerer's Stone and said I needed to read it before the movie came out so we could see it together. Fast forward almost ten years when my mom and I saw The Deathly Hollows Part 2 at the drive-in movie theater on opening night with my husband and stepdaughters and dog Buddy. Sadly, my mom passed away on the 1st of January 2020 from cancer. Harry Potter will always be a positive reminder of my mom and how much she knew I would like the Harry Potter series. The picture I shared for the Sorting Hat post is of my mom and me on her 70th birthday, 2 3 17. Thanks for letting me share my story. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Carrie. Yes, thank you so much. 
And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, which teams are playing in the final Quidditch match of the season? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag new optimism will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated, even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 30, Grop, and no corresponding film scenes since the only ones that do actually correspond with the second half of the chapter. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calming Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake.